Hi, welcome to Road to Vostok Devlog episode 2. If you're new to this channel and haven't watched that first introduction episode, I would highly recommend watching that before this video. There's some really important context for understanding some elements mentioned in this episode. I would also like to say thank you for everyone who watched, liked, commented and shared that introduction video. It's really awesome to see that many people really liked it, provided feedback and started following this journey of making Road to Vostok into a high quality commercial product. Now let's talk about this episode. Road to Vostok is a game where there are different zones and individual maps which are based on real world locations. This episode is going to be an in-depth analysis for one of those maps. The specific map is located in the area of 5 zone and it's called the village. Village is also the location that will be featured in that first public demo at the end of summer. So finalizing this map is going to be my main development priority for the next couple of months. I would also like to mention that in terms of this YouTube channel and upcoming map related content, my plan is to make two types of videos. For each map there will be an analysis video and also a trailer video. These map analysis videos like this one are going to be mostly developer talk, level design stuff and behind the scenes content and those map trailers will be short gameplay only videos without any voiceovers. For every map analysis video the format will be the same and there will be two main topics in each of those videos. These are map lore and level design. These analysis videos are not going to be the most action-packed videos on this channel, but because all of the maps are based on real-world locations, I want to demonstrate the design work that goes into these maps. Also, based on the previous video, a lot of people seem to like this style, where I'm also trying to explain how the things work from a game design perspective, compared to just showing some video clip related to the topic. So, without further ado, welcome to Village. Village is a rural area about 30 kilometers from the border zone. Before the tragic event occurred, village had a small but fairly tight community of people, mostly elders, but there were also younger families who moved there after hurting land and property from their parents. In terms of housing, village often lacked access to essential services such as running water or electricity. However, people who lived there were used to these shortages and most of the elderly had experienced wartime at the younger age, so this wasn't a big deal for them. There wasn't much activities in the village though. The most common ways to spend time were just gardening and fishing in the nearby sea. The highlight of the year was the village festival during Midsummer's Eve. During this festival, the people of the village came together and traditionally they smoked a whole pig, had a barbecue and of course drank way too much of alcohol. Villagers often drove to the border zone because they got cheap petrol from the other side of the border. In addition to cheap gasoline, tobacco and vodka were also often imported across the border and distributed among the villagers. One villager even took things a little further and often smuggled large quantities of these products on an old bus without paying any import taxes. Whenever this bus returned to the village from the border zone, the locals always knew that the fun times are coming and there was enough stuff to distribute for all the villagers. As a result of this smuggling, it was typical that the villagers had more than just canned food hidden in the basements. There were even rumors that someone had several ground gases full of tobacco and vodka as well as old Soviet weapons. Rumors of these ground gases spread so far that even the children of the neighboring villages often played a game called find a cache and at the night they set out to look for these caches with flashlights as if it were some exciting treasure hunt. In summary, life in the village was difficult at times, but there was a good team spirit in the village and everything seemed to be going well until everything changed that day in the border zone. Level design is a complex topic. There's a lot of variables involved like game genre, target platform and nuances like the abilities of the player's controller. Level design is also a process that usually requires multiple phases. In this episode I'm not going to cover all of this. I want to focus mainly on the big picture which in this case is the general map layout. 
the first thing I would like to talk about is this composition ideology called primary, secondary and tertiary. This ideology is well known in many fields of traditional art, but in my opinion it works really well for level design as well. If you look at these images, it's simply a matter of maintaining a balance and interest when it comes to the placement of things. From a level design perspective, you can think of these shapes as buildings for example. The goal is to create a map where there are details of different sizes and distributing them in a way that's appealing to the player and works for the level. Now let's start building our village level with this ideology. I start with just simple 2D shapes and colors. First I create the terrain, then I place the main elements like roads and water areas and after that I start distributing those details. I begin by placing the primary details, which in this case are the plots of land associated with the village houses. After that I place the actual main houses, which are those secondary level details. These are the largest buildings on that plot and they must be clearly visible to the player. Next up is the tertiary details, and these are the smaller buildings which could be suitable for those plots. These are things like sheds, warehouses and so on. And of course, there are also many other details involved to this village layout, but in order to keep things simple, let's go with just these. Next, I will put these details into groups, and let's take a closer look at what these buildings are in practice from the perspective of this village map. During this showcase, I will be silent. I hope you like the atmosphere of these photos that I took when I visited that location. Hopefully these photos convey the atmosphere that I'm trying to achieve with this village map and with this game in general. In my opinion, understanding and constructing these authentic post-apocalyptic environments is achieved only by the developer visiting and photographing these abandoned places himself. I have over 1000 photos from this location, but this specific mailbox photo is probably my favorite one. This photo symbolizes the idea pretty well that if the developer just stays at home on the computer it's pretty hard to visually understand these post-apocalyptic details like this one. And also, regarding those building images, you might be wondering what they're going to look like in the game. Here's one unfinished example. Now let's go back to this map layout and start adding more layers in terms of level design. The second topic I want to talk about is point of interest, also known as POE. Point of interest is basically a unique element of a level architecture that stands out from the composition. In terms of level design, these POEs are a great way to catch the player's eye and give general idea on level directions, but they are also useful for encouraging exploration and creating some variety in the level. Let's look a couple of examples from other games. In Fallout 4, when you first enter the open world from the vault, you will be presented with this view. This view isn't random, it's carefully designed just for the player's perspective. Point of interest have been thoughtfully placed in the view to help the player to navigate. These POEs are things like landmarks, leading lines and structures. The other good example is from Skyrim. In Skyrim, there's this huge open world and usually when you go out to do something like questing, you set yourself a clear destination, but the route to this destination is never really a straight line, even if the terrain allows it. The reason for this is the POEs placed by the developers, which are tactically sprinkled along certain routes and areas to encourage the player to explore and avoid boredom associated with the traveling. This level design tactic makes the route to the destination look more something like this 
which is a good thing, for my opinion. Fallout 4 and Skyrim have huge open world maps, but these same PoE principles can still be applied to smaller scale maps like this one. For example, I can place couple of PoEs to locations where I want the player to go, or which makes the level navigation easier. In terms of spawn points, which in Road to Vostok are called transition points, I also make sure that these POEs are visible and eye-catching to the player. In this episode, I don't want to reveal what these POEs actually are. Let's leave them as a surprise for that public demo. The last thing I want to talk about regarding level design is Hero Asset. The term Hero Asset has many purposes in game development, but when it comes to level design, it usually means something that is really unique and memorable in the level. Like, for example, in The Last of Us, when you enter this space, you will encounter such a memorable vision that this part of the level will remain in your memory for a long time. Without the helicopter crash, this part of the level would be just another desaturated space and easy to forget. Another example would be something like the Green Mountain and its radio tower in Daisy. This tower is definitely a point of interest and a big landmark, but it's also a hero asset. Let me explain. This specific tower is surrounded by a lot of different mysteries and rumors that add interest and depth to the game world. While these rumors are mostly community driven, like a secret radio transmission or occasional haunting, the main point here is that sometimes a well-placed simple 3D object can make a surprisingly big impact on the game and its story. So let's add one hero asset to this map layout. I'm willing to reveal what this is because it's kind of already mentioned in this episode. The hero asset of the village map will be that old bus, which was used for that smuggling operation mentioned in that map lore chapter. And here's the reference images for that bus. And now let's say that we are happy with this level layout. So let's move on to the next step. The next step is basically to create a playable village map and terrain in the game engine, based on this level design layout. In this context, I would like to mention that if you are a solo developer like me, and you have multiple maps that you have to make, you must have some clever approach to this, because there's no time for doing everything manually, like sculpting terrain, painting textures, placing assets, and so on. My clever way of doing this is a bit technical, but I will try my best to explain. First, we get rid of this fancy paper overlay and look at these simple shapes. There is a reason why I use these primitive shapes when I'm designing a level, and the reason is masking. I convert these colors to primary RGB colors, and each of these is going to be a unique mask for textures in the game engine. Then let's talk about rendering. In video games, basically everything that you see is made out of triangles, which are three-point polygons. These triangles are held together by vertex points, and each of these vertices is basically a small data container. These vertex points can store different types of data, but for this example, the most useful data type for us is that color data, also known as vertex color. This specific data type is also useful, because it provides interpolation between color data. This means basically that there's automatic gradients related to colors. The idea behind these gradients is that inside the game engine, we can transition between different ground textures smoothly, just like in nature and real life. And here comes the cool part. In video games, maps and terrains are basically made out of planes, and these planes have thousands of small triangles and vertex points. By using something called image to vertex color, I can transfer our village map layout to this plane's vertex points, and this process is totally automatic. And now we have an identical map layout that isn't no longer just a layout image, it's now a 3D plane with different masks stored in those vertex colors. Now let's bring this plane to game engine. I'm currently standing one of the main roads in the village, and the mask for this road was red color. And like mentioned in the previous episode, I have plenty of development tools available that are specifically designed for this game and these workflows like this one. For example, we can use this procedural generation tool that recognizes these vertex color masks and generate most of the nature assets that we need for this village map. Next development tool that we use is a custom terrain shader that automatically blends different ground textures to these vertex colors. Then let's add some of those village details. After this, I would use my displacement tool, which elevates the ground based on height maps, but that's probably a topic for another video. Let's finalize this level design example by adding some windy weather effect, and here's the result.
this was the first map analysis video on this channel. For some, videos like these are not the most interesting because these contain a lot of talking and less gameplay footage. My goal with this channel is to try to find a balance between these different style of videos, so the next video will definitely focus more on the gameplay content. It would be awesome to hear your opinion on this video and whether this format is good for presenting those other maps as well in the future. Thank you for watching and see you in the next episode.